Could an Almi diet really be your ticket to better mental health? Well, today's guest seems to think so. Her name is Judy Cho. She's a nutritional therapy practitioner and author of the profound yet controversial book, Carnivore Cure. She's here today to tell us not only about her healing story, but also how you just may be one ribeye away from the best mental health of your life. We're gonna ask her the tough questions. This is Road to Recovery. Um, so, you know, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Judy Cho. I'm also better known as Nutrition with Judy. Um, so I am a nutritional therapist and now I work with clients to get people to root cause healing and basically give back to the community because I was so sick and I firmly believe that nutrition and diet is so important in um, just getting back to healing. Um, and so, you know, my journey um, after college, I had a few pounds that I wanted to lose. And so people told me about the master cleanse and they said, hey, if you do this diet, um, you do. Uh, eat like lemon, uh, what is it? Lemonade water, basically with some maple syrup, you can clean out your body. Um, and the doctor that made that was very, very anti meat. And so as I read the book, I thought, Oh, you know, it makes sense. Uh, proteins kind of or meat animal based proteins putrefy in your gut. And that's why all this issues arise. And so basically, I decided to go plant based just for that period. And then I felt so good. And so I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to keep trying this. And then it became a 12 year experiment. Um, and so I lost the weight that I wanted, but I was also malnourished and I didn't know that. So, you know, people would say to me, oh, wow, you're plant-based. And I lived in California. And so obviously it's a more, you know, plant-based friendly area. And so I just kept hearing that, oh, you're so healthy now, you look so good now. And so I wanted to keep it up, but secretly I was starting to binge at night. Um, I think the lack of fat in my diet. And so, you know, I wasn't eating the avocado oils or the coconut oils that are, um, in all fairness, in a plant based diet. And so I think the lack of fat was having me have mental health issues. Um, the lack of proteins from animal meats were also affecting my moods. And so, um, you know, maybe outwardly, I looked healthy because I was at a thinner weight. But in general, my overall health was declining. So I started struggling with a lot of anxiety, um, a lot of um, depression, and then it just started to exacerbate an eating disorder. So um, I wanted to keep up the facade of, hey, I look so good and I'm so healthy now. So at night, although I was still plant based, I would eat a lot of really high fat. So like lots of cream. Um, so, you know, foods with a lot of heavy fat, it was probably like soybean oil though, but, um, lots of creams and lots of junk food with a lot of like junk in it. And I would binge off of that. And then it would end up being some type of restriction. So either over exercising, um, purging, um, other things that were just, you know, part of kind of an eating disorder. And, um, you know, I maintained it for a while and I struggled, uh, you know, many days I'd be super moody. People wouldn't want to kind of even talk with me because I'd be very short. I'd be very snappy. And then other days I'd, you know, I was almost bipolar in a sense because of my erratic moods from, um, the deficiency in nutrition and, um, and my eating disorder. And so when I had my first child, um, and I was still struggling, um, basically I got really sick and I ended up taking antibiotics. I think my gut health was a wreck and it just completely wiped me out. And, um, that was really where I started my health journey because I realized this is no longer about me. I have a child that I couldn't take care of. I had to go into an eating disorder facility and work on why am I using, um, image and, um, an eating disorder to kind of maintain happiness or to be worthy enough in society. And so working a lot of the cognitive cognitive behavioral part of my eating disorder was tremendously beneficial. I recommend therapy for anybody. Um, it doesn't even have to be for someone that's eating disorder just to get to know yourself is super important. But what I also learned in there was that their dietary recommendations weren't ideal. So they would say things like, Hey, if you are plant based, because I would still plant based in there, um, they were they would totally honor it. So I was never offered beef, I was never offered chicken, pork, and any of that. But if you were to say you were low carb or that you don't really eat sugar, they're like, no, no, that's an eating disorder. And so they would say your challenge food would be that you would have to eat a cupcake or this and that. But they would be fully okay with you not eating meat, and that 
seemed a little off to me. Um, and when I left there, I would still fall into habits over time. So a lot of my intuitive eating, the tools that I used in there helped me a lot. But when the days became hard, I started seeing, you know, the yellow flags that became red flags. And then I'd end up getting back into my eating disorder. And I just started researching more into nutrition. And I noticed that the higher fat was helping. So I was doing a ketogenic diet. Um, and then I just noticed that the more I would look into ketogenic diets, there was a lot of information on meat. And I just decided um, at one point that, hey, I'm just going to try to include a little bit of meat. It was 12 years. So it was definitely like a dilemma, right? So I identified as being plant-based. I identified as being a pescatarian with occasional fish. Um, I identified with being that kind of, you know, healthy person. And so to kind of disassociate from that was, uh, it was not that easy, but I knew that mm, I wanted to try it for my health and it was a complete change. So ever since going meat-based, um, I don't struggle with an eating disorder now. Uh, before I would be obsessed with, okay, wait, so how many calories did I eat today? Uh, what have I eaten? So what else can I eat today? Um, when was my last binge? You know, like there's all these kind of um, analytical thinking and obsession, obsession with food all day long. Um, and then, and now I don't have that. And, you know, the first year of carnivore was wasn't easy. Like there would be times where I'd fall back into keto with like keto treats. And so that's where I think for some people that maybe abstaining or eating less sugar um, can actually be a benefit because there are studies of how addictive sugar can be, and it could be in all forms of carbohydrates. So I just think that, you know, maybe you need to do it that extreme to kind of find a new balance. Um, I think it's really bio individual, but that is what has really helped us um, me grow and not struggle from an eating disorder was basically properly nourishing my body with the foods that I needed to thrive. No, that, that actually, it's really interesting because I, I think a lot of us uh, with eating disorders <clears throat> at any point can relate to some aspect of your story. Because I remember when, when you were talking about binging, for instance, I had thought uh, about even a year and a half ago, I thought I'd basically been recovered. I made videos mm -hmm. on my own personal channel basically saying like, I recovered and I did a whole interview with my friend about yeah. how I recovered. And then I would look at those videos and I was slowly letting my eating disorder actually control moments of my life then because I would do basically, I was basically doing keto throughout the week. And then on one day a week, I would binge like crazy mm -hmm. and do, um, oh, I would just like eat a bunch of crap all of a sudden for some reason. I would go to IHOP, like eat a bunch of pizza, basically do a huge sugar bomb day. And so I think, I think what you said, and something I noticed too recently is as I've kind of transitioned back into more, uh, at least for myself, more of an animal-based uh, eating. Um, I'm not full carnivore. It's more of like a heavy keto, a lot of mm -hmm. animal foods. I have noticed that with the higher level of fats, mm -hmm. I'm assuming, at least my level of thinking is more steady throughout the day. And I'm not as erratic um, as I have been in the past. And Tommy could probably counter that uh, with some of our conversations in recent past, <laughs> but at least I'd like to think. Absolutely. That. But one thing I did want to want to ask was, as as you know, eating disorders destroy a lot of different organ systems in the body. They they can wreak havoc on basically every part of your body, and, and especially your mind. And so, carnivore, in, in many circles, would be completely against what standard ed recovery specialists or like what you've been taught tommy as an ed recovery coach would be told yeah. to help a client with and, and and you mentioned this when you were in uh in the where, where you're working with people and they were like oh eating a cup you need to eat a cupcake if you abstain from sugar that's an eating disorder right so i kind of wanted yeah, you to sure. maybe elaborate on on that aspect a little bit and why you think carnivore or a more animal based eat is a way of eating can be helpful and why maybe this current paradigm of ed recovery may be slightly misguided or or something like that. sure um let me talk let me touch upon the yeah. thing about the moods that you just had brought up so yeah. a lot of our neurotransmitters are created in the intestines and so 
the thought is that as you are removing a lot of the plant-based foods, which um, have toxins, right? So if you think about it, animals can run from their predators. So the way that the plants can protect themselves is to have anti-nutrients. So it's to have some sort of toxin within their genetic makeup to protect themselves so that they have offsprings, right? So they want you to eat certain things, maybe fruits, um, but we even finagle the fruits to be extra sweet, right? So it's not even really the nature's food of um, uh, fruit. But so if you think about it, um, you know, nowadays everyone kind of accepts that, okay, gluten is a toxin, right? So gluten is an anti-nutrient, right? So if you think about gluten and if you believe in gluten, well, there's a ton of anti-nutrients in a, a lot of plant-based foods. So lectins, phytates, um, oxalates are some of the more serious ones that can do gut damage. And so if you're eating a lot of plant-based foods that are damaging your gut, and then also bind and block mineral absorption in your other foods. So if you're eating meats with your spinach that is high in oxalates that then bind to certain minerals, then you're not even getting the minerals from your meats because a lot of the spinach is kind of undoing the benefits. So with all that said, if you then stop eating a lot of the plants and then you start eating more meats and higher fats, your gut's probably getting a rest from these toxins. And so therefore, that's probably why you may then want to absorb more of your nutrients because the small intestine is where you absorb most of your nutrients. And then secondly, when you are eating a lot more fat, well, your fats are basically created from um your, sorry, your hormones are created from fats and some proteins too. So with all of that, right, your neurotransmitters will then get better supported. So for example, dopamine, a lot of it's created in your small intestine, um, your uh, serotonin 80, no, I think 90% of the body serotonin is created in your gut. So if you are not providing one, the nutrients to support that, and then two, if you have a lot of toxicity in your small intestine, then your body's not even able to use those neurotransmitters or even create them. And so then the kind of um, what is created in your gut will not necessarily hit the brain, but the messengers will all communicate that there's all this, you know, serotonin in the body. And so the thought is that basically, as you eat more meat and higher fat, you actually will stabilize mood. So the thought, the outcomes that you felt, um, there's probably a lot of truth to it by eating a meat based diet. So that's kind of one about your moods. Um, and then in terms of disordered eating, so you know, I have seen that a lot in the carnivore communities, people say, well, if you only eat meat and you're really scared to eat any kind of plant, then you're orthorexic, right? Or you're you have some type of disorder where it's like um, you're limiting all these other foods, and that is not you know truly healing. Well, again, the argument should be really you know I think it's bio individual. I do think there are people that are in the carnivore community that are absolutely eating disordered, right? So I think that if you are you know over like your story about um, the IHOP scenario, so if you are like, I am carnivore five days, and then two days, I am flexible eating, and then you notice you're binging, or you're allowing yourself to binge. Or maybe it's that you're just eating meat based, but then you eat one meal a day, and you eat like 3000 calories in a sitting. And then you're like, Oh, my gosh, I ate too much today. Tomorrow, I'm going to fast. That is a little bit of a binging restriction, right? So one, you have to know why you do the things you do. So if you know, innately, or internally, that you may be using these as like eating disorder behaviors, and that's not ideal, right? But let's say you don't have any of that, and you're just eating a meat based diet. Um, if you remove a lot of the toxic foods that are, you know, shown to have anti nutrients, so a lot of these plant based foods, then the question is, are you really, you know, is it really an eating disorder? So in my book, I talk about, you know, before getting into meat, before getting into plants, I say, before we talk about plants versus um, animals types of foods, let's just talk about the process additives that we add, the food coloring, the genetically modified foods. Let's remove all of that. And then let's see what foods remain. And if you do that, most of our processed foods, most of the foods that we have in the grocery stores are limit um, are removed. And from a health perspective, that is, I don't think that's an eating disorder, you're removing toxic foods, right? So why would you be eating foods that are not good for you? As an example, I always talk about the red dye, it's in the book. But mm -hmm. um, I think the FDA has been trying to um, ban it from our foods for a very long time. I think the one article I cited was even in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And they keep getting uh, 
you know, whatever the case is, but they keep getting denied. And so they were finally able to get the red dye removed from our personal care products. So it's no longer in makeup, no longer in lipstick, uh, shampoo, conditioners, et cetera, but it's still in our foods, right? So, Hey, it's not safe for us to put on our skin, but it's safe for us to consume, right? So it's the maraschino cherries, the fruit roll-ups, the really bright red ones um, that is known to cause cancer, but we are consuming it as if it's safe. So again, if you remove all these kind of like toxic nuances, then you're really left with whole foods, right? And then I do a deeper dive on our plants, right? So if we're eating a lot of soy products or we're eating a lot of the genetically modified foods, well, I talk about how um, it has been proven that non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and other cancers are tied to genetically modified foods. So then if you remove all of that, and you just focus on organic, like plant-based foods, then you kind of have to look at, well, they use like four to five times the amount that they would use of any um, kind of lab created herbicide or pesticide. So is it really safe for our bodies, right? That we're consuming this amount of toxins in certain plants. Um, and then also on top of that, we have been over the decades and centuries, we're modifying our plant foods to not be what it used to look like. Like if you looked at, if you search for how corn used to look before, like the maize plant looked before we kind of, you know, finagled it. Um, same thing with uh, how watermel watermelons used to look. So if you were to remove all of those, then you kind of almost end up with an animal-based diet. And so the question becomes, is that really eating disordered or are you just removing toxic foods that you know may be inherently bad for us to be consuming? And so I think the... Sh short answer is you just have to know yourself. So if you are using a carnivore diet to further your eating disorder, so I'm going to binge for a full day, and then I'm going to fast or do extended fasting for a while, I think that's restrictive um, behaviors, right? So this is where I talk about this in the book too, about eating disorders. It's a big part of my life. And um, I would hate for people to use a meat based diet to further their um, anorexic, bulimic behaviors. And so this is where you really have to know yourself and identify, you know, are you using fasting for a healthy method? Are you using an animal based diet for a healing method? Or are you using it to kind of further your eating disorder? No, I think that's, I think that's a brilliant, <clears throat> what you just pointed out because um, it's, it all goes back to purpose. And, and I think like for myself, like for instance, um, I, I'll use myself as an example because I, I, I won't judge anyone else that way. Um, like a year and a half ago, I started developing some neurological problems, uh, tingling in my hands, my feet, my face, all of these different things. And I highly tied it to the way I had been treating my body with my eating disorder and my binging. And even though I was weight restored, the way I had been eating a lot of the ways, but I knew from that moment forward, I knew that I not only needed to address those problems which I still ongoingly need. Like you said, you mentioned having support, whether that's therapy or having someone else to talk to, you always need a support system for those things. But I right. also knew the importance that nutrition at a base level was going to be in order to address any of those problems. Because the answer wasn't going to be necessarily the standard approach to treating a disordered eating mind. Like eating cake and stuff wasn't going to help my nerve problems. In fact, it probably was going to make them worse depending on why I got them in the first place. And like you said, a lot of the things we eat today are not at all what they even used to be a hundred years ago in a lot right. of ways. And so when we look at what normal eating should be, I like to look at it and as you do as well, probably from an ancestral point of view, what were we eating when we were hunter gatherer people kind of prior to the large uh, agriculture revolution and a lot of the, especially the last over the last hundred years introduction of vegetable oils, processed foods, all of those things. And I think when, and, and, and I think a lot of mental health problems that we see today are not only, not only do we just recognize them more, they're more prevalent because we're looking for them, but I think that they're happening more because of the things we've introduced into our bodies and our environments over the last 50 to 100 years that, like you said, um, uh, has, has affected people's minds, anxiety, all of these things can 
Yeah, I've, I've seen so many people find success uh, with animal-based eating with anxiety and other mental health problems. And I think a lot of it has to do with removal of certain things from from their diet. And um, Tommy, do you have anything to, to add in here or talk about? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that because I believe any lifestyle can be used to further an eating disorder. I mean, there's people in the plant-based vegan community that's obviously got an eating disorder as well. I've seen plenty of them. I was an ex-vegan myself and I suffered a lot of health issues, just similar to what you actually spoke about, Judy. Obviously, kind of cognitive issues. I was suffering with brain fog, short-term memory loss. I actually thought I had a stroke at one point because my whole side of my left side was actually all facial drooping and I feel, I feel that there's a, there's not enough information out there, obviously, to people who actually know what is best because there's a, an awful lot of agendas pushed by a lot of people and everybody's kind of unsure of what is best for them. And I feel it's really good the way you actually said that obviously to do what's kind of best for you on an individual basis. Yeah, no, I would agree. Um, so I guess uh, how would you assess, Judy, um, if this approach that, that you've been working with with your clients, yeah. as, a, as of course everyone is, Every one of your clients is a little different. You got to do tweaks for them. Sure. But how would you How would you assess if uh, kind of this animal based way of eating would be suitable for someone? And then, kind of a follow up to that, are there people that it's not suitable for at all? That, that I, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. So, I mean, the fact that animal based foods are the most nutrient dense and bioavailable. So meaning one, um, if you were to just get like a certain amount of meat, and then a certain amount of like broccoli, and then you were to kind of think about how plants nutrition has to be con um, converted to even be ab absorbed. So for example, with carrots, um, they're, they're known for the beta carotene for the use of vitamin A, but some people don't have the genetic makeup to convert beta carotene to the vital vitamin A that is absorbable by the body, but, or you can eat liver, which has a ton of vitamin A, right? So again, there's these kind of, um, simple things about the fact that meat is more bioavailable. So it's in the forms that our body can naturally use. So if you have any digestive impairment, if your gut isn't functioning as well, then eating a meat-based diet, you have a higher chance of absorbing the nutrients versus if you were to eat plant-based food. So um, if I were to, I have not met anybody yet that couldn't do a meat-based diet. Now there are definitely nuances that you'll have to use as levers. So maybe some people are adrenally taxed. And so fasting initially may not be ideal, right? So sometimes you want to use fasting as a way to kind of uh, rest the digestive process. And so other things can be working in the body. But if you are, are somebody that has high chronic cortisol, maybe that's something you don't, it's not that uh, fasting itself will cause your cortisol or your adrenals to be overly used. But if it's one more thing that may just kind of break the, you know, camel's back type of thing. So um, you know, maybe fasting is not something I would use initially. Um, for some people, uh, you know, any types of herbs or plants are not beneficial, even from a medicinal perspective. And so, you know, I have to find things that are more animal based that may be able to support them in terms of kind of gut healing supports in the beginning. But if you are malnourished, or you have gut issues, the best form of nutrients that you can get just because your body may not be able to absorb other nutrients is an animal based diet. Um, I don't think there's any other diet that has just as much nutrition that is in the forms again that uh, you can use uh, for the body. So another example would be, you know, a lot of plant based diet advocates, or maybe not even plant based, maybe just people that include plants. Um, they argue that you need fiber, right? So for a good gut microbiome, you need fiber to feed the short chain fatty acids, um, which is butyrate is one uh, from short chain fatty acid foods, um, from fibers, from plants. But the argument is, well, the thing is those plants, you have to assume that your gut is in a good enough condition to break down these short chain fatty acids to then become the butyrate to support your gut. Um, and while that's all of a true statement, well, what if you don't have the gut health, right, to even do that? And then you're just going to get backed up with all this excess fiber. Um, why not just consume butter when it is derived from the Latin word butyrate, right? So butter is in the form that your gut needs for 
gut nourishing nutrients. It doesn't need to do any of these like short chain fatty acid conversions to get to butyrate. Um, you can take acetate, which is from, you know, yes, I guess it's technically from plants, but it's acetate, which is another form of short chain fatty acid um, nutrients, right? So I think we have been so taught that, hey, um, you can get vitamin D from plants, you could get protein from plants, like uh, pea protein, you could get um, K, uh, vitamin K, vitamin um, uh, yeah, D again, but all of those have to, again, be converted to be in the usable form. Whereas you can use, um, you know, we have to convert K1 to some of the K2 for it to be in the, the better nutrient to stop blood clotting. Well, you can just eat chicken or fish or some other meats to get the K2 that is, you know, in the bioavailable form to be absorbed. So, you know, are there certain people that wouldn't do good on an animal based diet? I don't think so. I mean, it's just the nutrients are in the best form. And then if you're hurting from any gut issues, um, this is the cleanest diet that you can eat that will be the least toxic, um, and least disruptive, least stressing on the diet, um, on the gut. Now you may have to switch up macros and maybe eat a higher, like, so, you know, hormones are made from, a lot of them are made from fat. So your cortisol, if you're a highly stressed person, you're probably using a lot of cortisol. Cortisol is made from cholesterol. So if you're eating a lower fat diet, that's going to be a disservice to your body. You need raw nutrients or raw materials to even make these cortisol, for example. So that's where higher fat may be ideal. So for women that are struggling with menopause or that have lost their period, they may need to do a carnivore diet, but a higher fat version, right? So there's little nuances, but there's no one that I could say would be better on like a plant-based or a more, um, you know, plant plus meat diet. No, that's actually, I mean, that's actually a really interesting point about the, um, I, I agree with you personally, but I, I just, I just had to ask that question for, yeah. for sake of the, for I, sake totally, of the I totally agree as well, but I think that was take us on to the next point. Obviously a lot of people obviously worry about the kind of dangers that a lot of people talk about, about high meat intake diets, obviously causing things like heart disease and cancers. I wonder if you could kind of give us some context and maybe alleviate some fears that are actually out there and kind of set us on the truth about that. Yeah. So if you look into the studies about heart disease, for example, uh, for one, um, heart disease started, it, it wasn't even a big deal a hundred years ago. So there was mm -hmm. a person and I don't even remember his name, but they, you know, came up with the heart monitor, heart rate monitor detection and no doctor wanted to buy it because there was no one that was really having heart disease. Um, so that was in the early like 100 years ago. And then um, I think in the 50s, when we started introducing more like margarine and more soybean type of, um, you know, fats, I, I think it was Eisenhower, our president had a heart attack. And then there was this fear of, oh, my gosh, what is causing heart disease? And it was just all of a sudden, increasing. So heart disease and stroke was just becoming more prevalent. And so there was a guy named Ansel Keys that said, I'm going to do the studies. And um, he actually studied like 23 countries, but he published a paper that said, hey, we studied seven different countries. And in these countries, um, they showed that basically saturated fats. So the fats from meats from butter is what causes um, heart disease and, you know, other disease. And so um, then we became this country that was anti-fat, right? So mm -hmm. hey, yeah. first, first it became um, a, a saturated fat is bad for you. And now I think um, we've kind of turned a tide where it's now it's like, okay, we'll consume good fats, but good fats is more like, I don't know, like avocado oil type stuff or like the omega nines. Um, but the thing is, again, as we, I just talked about when we are in a stress state, um, we need more cholesterol, um, from foods that are rich in saturated fats, right? So we mm -hmm. need the butters, we need the animal fats because that is what is causing us to support our endocrine system. But going back to Ansel Keys, he cherry picked seven countries when he actually studied 23. Yeah. So he purposely removed countries that didn't fit his hypothesis that it was saturated fat that caused heart disease. There were other countries and I listed in the book, I can't remember off the top of my head what countries, but there were countries that ate very high saturated fat. I think France was one of them and they didn't mm -hmm. really have heart disease. And there were other countries where they ate very uh, low 
uh, saturated fats and they had a lot of heart disease. And all of those countries, of course, he cherry picked and removed them. Um, you know, the, so that was one. So uh, Ansel Keys did a lot with our dietary kind of recommendations. So it was really with his studies and his recommendations that um, the heart association and stuff became very anti-saturated fats. Um, there's another kind of study that's been running for now six decades. I also talk about it in the book. It's the Framingham studies. So they do all this research on heart disease, what causes it. And um, they have found that um, it, there's like little nuances. So they're the ones that found that, hey, there's a correlation with smoking and heart disease, right? So they find all these nuances. And one thing they found is that um, cholesterol does go up in a higher fat diet, but that doesn't mean it's bad. It's in context, right? So they found that if LDL goes up, which is considered like the bad cholesterol, mm -hmm. if it goes up, but so does HDL, the risk of heart disease actually does not go up. Um, it minimally goes up. Um, it's the c risk of not having enough HDL with the LDL that then makes it a higher risk factor, but HDL will go up if you eat a lot of good animal fats. The other thing is if you have a lot of floating triglycerides, right? So triglycerides are the kind of um, fat for fuel in your blood that kind of circulating. Um, people that eat a lot of carbohydrates, it converts to triglycerides and it's floating in the blood. So you want to have it. I think standard care recommends under 150. But if you look at most meat-based dieters, keto dieters, their triglycerides are under 100. You want it to be under 100. That's another kind of a risk risk measure, right? So again, a lot of people that are um, standard care dieters, they may eat um, carbohydrates and even healthier ones, and they have maybe 120 tri level of triglycerides, you want to kind of get to like 60, 70, 80. Um, that is more ideal. So again, it's a lot of misinformation. I talk in depth about cholesterol, and you know, all of this heart disease and just the falsities that we've been basically raised to believe. Absolutely. I think as well, a lot of the vegans obviously always talk about the Adventist Day study, but when you actually look into it, it's mostly vegetarians that was in that study. And a lot of them were obviously, the, the rest were obviously ethical vegans as well. So you've got to kind of really look at these studies and actually kind of answer, ask questions and where they're actually, the funding's coming from, who's actually doing them as well. But just like you said, cholesterol as well. I think cholesterol, low cholesterol as well is really, really has been associated with a lot of things like obviously risk seeking behavior, obviously all cause mortality as well. So yeah, I totally agree. What yeah, you and, to say with that, Ryan? Uh, one more thing I wanted to add that I forgot is that, so in the book, I talk about how um, we have levers in the body for cholesterol. So the majority of our cholesterol in our body is actually not from um, our foods Our we have like a little mechanism that kind of figures out, okay, so majority of our cholesterol is produced within the body and our brain is 60% cholesterol. So it's 60% fat. And so when we are eating excess cholesterol, the body will kind of taper down on some of the cholesterol either absorbed from the foods or that we produce within the body. So if it has these self-regulatory systems and most of our cholesterol in our body is actually not from the foods we're consuming, then think about what statins do, right? So mm -hmm. statins are just removing cholesterol, period. Yeah. And if our brain is 60% cholesterol, then is that the reason there is some sort of association? And I know association does not mean causation, causation, but there is a correlation between especially men that take statins and that start having mental health issues where they become more, um, you know, just unstable, just angry, uh, more violent, um, depressed. So is it because we are now taking statins that remove cholesterol when our brain is 60% cholesterol? And then the other thought is, um, if you see the kind of markers or statistics for heart disease, 50% of people that get heart disease or have heart attacks have normal levels of cholesterol. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. That actually made me that whole, um, that the whole thing on, on fat and cholesterol and saturated fat <clears throat> is really fascinating to me because I, so I, I'm a stickler with my blood work. I love looking at my blood work. Um, it's been kind of a hobby over the last year and a half. Um, <laughs> but uh, something that I found really interesting was I had my, my dad just went in recently for his own checkup and okay. he's, he's been on statins for probably 20 years. He has high blood pressure. A lot of the generic problems that you see, especially in America today, uh, probably some metabolic dysfunction stuff like that. Um, doesn't particularly 
he eats a fair amount of carbs, but was always active and stuff like that. Didn't worry about it. But his, uh, what I noticed in his blood work and I thought was fascinating was like, yeah, the statin's working. It's, uh, it's doing its thing. His cholesterol is in the normal range. Uh, although his HDL is mega, mega, mega low. And he says it's always been low, which is kind of like some people are generally lower, but I'll get back to that in a second. Yeah. And his triglycerides were, they were okay. And so I was thinking the other thing is uh, along with statins is statins also uh, deplete certain nutrients in your body, especially really? CoQ, CoQ10 um, and stuff like that. So I, I was, I, I've just been thinking lately as I've been kind of diving into this uh, animal, animal based way of eating myself. If, if, if my dad were to possibly adopt some of these principles, would you see, probably see his cholesterol go up, but would you see his other levels of HDL and triglycerides change as well in a more positive fashion? And I bet you would. And so, yeah, absolutely. Um, can I, am I able to share something? Um, I yeah, you, you, you can, yeah. The, the little shares the screen down. Okay, let me see if I can click on this. Okay. Um, let me move the camera. Okay. Yeah, so I just wanted to show this real quickly. Um, let me see. How do you share a screen on here? <laughs> you know what I mean? See, we've never done see, it. see it down at the bottom, Ryan. Okay, maybe the like camera and mic. Okay, there you go. So yeah. this is a Framingham study. So I actually did this for Saladino's Paul Saladino's book. Um, so it's actually his graphic, but we um, we worked on it together. So anyways, um, this basically shows, this is that six decade study. So this um, Framingham, they've been doing these heart kind of studies for a very long time. And now they're in their sixth decade. So they keep um, tracking same family. So that's how they see some of the correlations that, hey, yes, there are genetics that where HDL can be lower. But I really just wanted to, you know, drive this point home. But if you look at this, can right. you can you click the? Do you see on the bottom of your screen a share screen button? Because um, I I'm only seeing you right now. Oh yes. really? Okay. Uh, Say for some reason. I I clicked on it. I thought. Uh, oh, I see. I see. Okay. Yes. Do you see it? I don't see. No yet. No. Oh okay. Now I see it. Okay there. Ah there it is. There that's we go. A, that, that's us. I because I, I love this graphic because I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I just wanted to show, and I have a version of this in my book. It's a little different, but basically, if you look at this, um, this is the risk of cardiovascular disease, right? And so it shows, yes, if your LD go, L goes up, your risk of cardiovascular disease definitely goes up. But really, the other factor is HDL. So if your HDL is low and your LDL is high, then yes, your risk of cardiovascular disease goes up tremendously. But if you look at HDL and it's high with your LDL going up, then it, the risk is not as much there. And this is where context is super important. Mm -hmm. If your father is eating a lot of carbohydrates, then that's probably why maybe his LDL is also going up with, but his HDL is lower. If he incorporates more like olive oil and I mean, I know that's a plant-based fat, but if he were to incorporate more fish and just other meats, his LDL will go up for sure. Normally it does, but his HDL will go up. And then in that context, does it matter that his overall cholesterol is higher, right? It, oh it doesn't. And so- you know, that's again, where, you know, context matters. And um, it's unfortunate that that's not the conversation being said. It's really, you know, at least nowadays, I feel like standard care doctors actually talk about, okay, these little nuances in cholesterol, but before it used to be just total cholesterol was looked at. And then if it was high, then you needed to get on a statin. But like you said, they never also tell you, well, hey, if you get on a statin, you should probably take some CoQ10. Um, there's a graphic in the book that talks about all the nutrient depletions in different forms of medication, right? So if you take an antidepressant, you need to take other vitamins because it also depletes those vitamins. Um, if you take a birth control pill, same thing, right? But these are never talked about. And then we wonder why we have mental health issues or why we have other like physical health issues, right? Because we are not being told that, hey, Whenever you put something in your body, it's either going to be a friend or a foe. And even if it's a foe to be a temporary band-aid, you also need to give other nutrients then to support your body to like one, detox it from a liver perspective, right? So if you're eating medication that your liver has to then detox, well, then I hope that you're consuming foods that will support your liver. You know what I mean? Like these yeah. are not talked about. And then we wonder why are we getting sick, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good point, and it's it's really fascinating to me because it makes me think about 
basically our paradigm is messed up. The, the, the medical paradigm and the way we, we treat patients on a symptomatic basis, not at a root cause basis. And that's just the whole base problem with the way our Absolutely. system is set up. You, but, you, know, you know as well, Ryan, obviously recently I, I had removed a lot of carbohydrates from my diet. I was down to about 50 grams of carbohydrates. And then I recently started to add in a lot of carbohydrates and I was back up to around about 350 grams of carbohydrates a day. I actually went to the doctor and my triglycerides were really, really high. The doctor's, the doctor's advice was to go back to a plant-based diet. He, he said that I, it was basically the, the meat intake and everything that I was having. And I found, in my opinion, it was definitely the carbohydrates that was the driver. Well, I would say that's true because relatively, um, based on what I know, you don't eat a ton of meat. Or no, you weren't eating a ton of meat. Yeah, basically just fish, really, yeah. and eggs. <laughs> well, what what I what I wanted to get into next uh, briefly with you, Judy, was this idea of the real problems with these diseases is not what symptomatically is coming out and is be therefore being addressed by the medicine. Like I often think about, I was given a long, long time. I was on an SSRI mm -hmm. uh, for anxiety and depression and stuff. And I noticed once I started eating more fat in general, um, I felt my mood was a lot better. We talked about that earlier, and I actually am not on an SSRI anymore. Um, yeah. But what I wanted to talk about is, so there's a lot of buzz, and you just did an awesome series uh, and interview with um, on, on gut health, which I say everyone should go check out. We'll put it in the show notes yeah. and the description. It's really, mm -hmm. really interesting. And I wanted to ask you, what role do you believe uh, our gut health plays in the manifestation in quite a lot of disease and how can kind of animal-based eating or carnivore address that based on what you've learned? Yeah. So I think gut health is the ultimate key to health. Um, I believe it's absolutely root cause. If you think about it, our food is what's fueling our body, whether it's going to be healthy, whether it's going to be sick. Um, obviously genetics plays a role. So if you have the genetics um, lucky lottery card and you can eat crap and live forever, there are people that are like that. But for most of us, um, what we fuel our body really makes an impact. And so for me, um, the biggest thing was my mood, right? So I also was on SSRIs. I started at let's see, like, I think 25 milligrams. And then I was at the highest at like 250 milligrams. And then it wasn't working enough. So then the doctor was like, okay, well, maybe we'll get you on a kind of side, um, you know, like, hey, this works for bipolar, or this works for mm -hmm. some other disease, but we've also seen it kind of help with depression. And it was always this, let me give you more medicine. And it, within two years, I went from the lowest dosage to the highest because it wasn't working as well. And again, it's just why are we using these band-aids when, you know, we can get to root cause healing and a lot of that's the gut, but, um, the, the danger with all these medicines and these temporary supports is that you don't get to root cause. And then eventually it could put, you know, it's like your body is giving you little signals that, Hey, I'm not happy with the way you're eating, or I'm not happy with, with the way you're living. And so I'm going to show you signs. So it could be skin health. It could be gut health. It could be mood disorders. Right. And so your body is basically saying, I'm unhappy, find me a new balance. Right. And if you just mask these illnesses or ailments with band-aids, so like an SSRI or, um, or, you know, like if you have a allergic response and you just take the Benadryl, well, over time, the toxins build up or your illness is bad enough that you can get a bigger disease. And that's what we kind of want to get away from, right? We, we don't want to take um, insulin because we're diabetic, right? Maybe we should just drop the sugars, for example, because over time, if you don't manage the diabetes and um, the just taking extra insulin is not going to cure you from getting these really bad diseases because of diabe diabetes. Um, so with that said, so if you think about what SSRI is, we just talked about this, but it's a, it basically blocks serotonin from getting um, uptake in from your brain so that there's extra so you can feel better, right? So again, if 90% of your serotonin is in your gut, and, and yes, serotonin cannot go into your brain from the gut. But it all connects and it all um, it talks to one another as chemical signals. And so if you know that 90% of your um, serotonin is in your gut, and that actually also affects your melatonin levels in your gut and then the, how that can affect your sleep, if we were to nourish our bodies with the food that's not toxic to the gut again, 
And then you eat a lot of fat to also nourish your hormones and the communication of hormones. Um, then that is probably the best way to get to root cause healing. Um, every single client I work with, they all have a little bit of gut healing to do. So if you think about what causes us to have low stomach acid, that can be taking NSAIDs. So if you take a little bit of Advil, if you take antibiotics, if you have a high stress life, if you have been eating a poor diet, um, if you've been dehydrated. So basically everything that all of us do growing up, right? All of those things then make our stomach acid lower. And then if you have heartburn and you're taking like PPIs or you're taking antacids, that also further reduces your stomach acid. And so then once you start eating your food and you don't have enough stomach acid, your food is not properly digested. And then when it finally gets to the small intestine where it's supposed to be absorbed, you have like bigger proteins that are not broken down to be absorbed. And so what ends up happening is as you're eating like the, again, the plant-based foods that have the lectins, phytates that also rips apart your um, small intestine, causing more like leaky gut, um, having more of the proteins get into your bloodstream because you're basically the tight junctions are no longer tight in your intestines. And so that's how people get autoimmune, right? So one of the foods that has a protein will get um, into your bloodstream, your immune health will then tag it as an invader. And if there's a, another protein in your body that looks similar to it, maybe your thyroid, um, then it starts attacking your thyroid. And that's how people get Hashimoto's. Um, so if you think about it, as you heal your gut and you eat the more nutrient dense foods with less toxins, one, you're giving your gut health a rest, and then it can focus on other stuff. It doesn't have to have the immune system always fighting these toxic foods. And then secondly, it's helping the liver and the kidneys, which are your detox pathways, not have to kind of filter through all these toxic medications you're taking, um, plants that you might be consuming that might be in excess. Like blueberries are toxic to our body, but it's the hormetic effect or the effect of the good outweighing the bad that makes it beneficial. But if you're eating excess blueberries, that's going to be a toxin to your body, right? Mm -hmm. So if you remove all of that and you strengthen your gut, then naturally we see the things kind of all work together, right? So your gut health is where the food will either help you or it will hurt you. And so from a foundational point of view, you need to do what will support your gut. And a lot of, if you look deeper into it, like all elimination diets from a gut healing protocol, they remove all different kinds of plant foods. So it could be sugars, it could be oligosaccharides, it could be different plants, different sugars, but all of them include meat. And why is that, right? Why is that if you think about that? And so that's why my book, The Carnivore Cure, the elimination part of it is just a meat-based because there's AIP, Whole30, um, SCD, uh, FODMAP, all of these gut healing diets, they have almost a lot of plants removed, but not everything. So what if we just removed all plants and how would we be at least from an elimination perspective to heal? Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty interesting point. I know Tommy, I know you can relate hardcore to this. I can to an extent um, when you were vegan, having a lot of like digestive distress and actually lowering such things like fiber actually yeah. helped in a lot of ways. Cause it's just your gut health's just all messed up. So I, I, I suppose that my, my question with the, uh, with going for the, the carnivore as sort of an elimination diet is um, how long does somebody like how, like a usual client, how long would you suggest they go on that before? Cause I know you also um, have some people reintroduce foods later. So how yeah. long, how long is that process usually? It depends. I mean, obviously it depends on the person and how yeah. sick they are. It depends on how compliant they are. So some people will, like you said, will do the like five days on and then two days off, but the two days off can do a lot more kind of, you know, regressing. And so one is how clean. And then it's also, you know, I think a lot of people in the carnivore space, they just are like, Oh, it's such an easy diet. You just eat meat. And so they just eat whatever meats they want and they don't work mm. on macros. And so for those people it may take longer. I think if, you were to, let's say you just decided to do carnivore and you just are like, I'm just going to work with somebody right from the beginning. I would say within six months, you can find tremendous healing, um, especially if you work on focusing on the gut. So every single client that works with me, they are in on at least, they at least start with one gut healing kind of support. And I have not had a single client that has not needed some kind of gut healing support from the beginning of their carnivore journey. So I'd say six months is um, a huge you'll find tremendous healing. Um, I think even within three months, but again, you have to dial in the macros. So, and what I mean by macros is 
you get energy from either glucose in the body or you get energy from fat. So if you are eating a leaner protein diet and not having a lot of fat and then also removing carbohydrates, then you are leaning on gluconeogenesis where your body will break down amino acids and convert it into glucose for energy. But that's a very inefficient process. It takes a lot of nutrients in your body to even do that and a lot of energy. And so you may feel a lot of fatigue, right? So your body will be always working on trying to give you energy by doing that gluconeogenesis, but, and it's going to raise your blood sugar levels. And that's how you can kind of test if you're eating too much protein. The ideal thing to do is eat higher fat and moderate your protein. And so you're getting your energy from fat. A lot of people in the space will say, no, if you have fat on your body and you're in ketosis, you should just use the fat from your body as energy. But I think that's um, very short-sighted, especially for women that have hormonal issues. No, I think that, that makes quite a bit of sense. I think something that, that I find um, interesting is I'll, I'll be in some carnivore groups, uh, especially on Facebook, and, and a lot of them have a, a really black and white view of carnivore where I mm-hmm. think it's a little more nuanced. Yeah. How important would you say food quality is? like? If you can't, and I would say everyone also has different financial issues, but that's of course different, but I see people eating like salami and like pepperoni and processed meats Mm -hmm. and, and stuff like, and it's like, so where is that nuance and how important is that in, in kind of the gut healing process? Yeah. So I would say, okay, so the way that I typically go is more than, um, about if it's grass fed or pasteurized it more than that type of. Um, ideal eating. So that is ideal, right? So if you can get animals that are grass fed, pasteurized, or or, sorry, pasture raised, um, you know, and grass finished, that type of thing, that is the most ideal, but some people just don't have the money for it, or they don't, um, they don't like the taste of it. So I always say, regardless of those ideals, I'd rather people eat just real meat. So get the meats from the meat part of the market, not the kind of deli um, process meats, because if you are trying to heal your gut, the more natural it can be. So, you know, getting steaks and getting ground beef um, that is fresh, um, chicken, pork, fish, eating a variety. I think it's so important. Um, As an example, if you eat just beef, uh, thiamine is the richest in pork. And so I think it's a disservice not to be eating like pork belly, right? That has 80% fat. If you can't get the pasture raised versions of pork, fine, just get the ones from the grocery store. That's not a big deal. But I'd rather you eat pork belly than over um, eating processed bacon. Um, As you're trying to heal your gut, the less processing you eat, the better it can be. So think about it always from a toxin perspective. Mm -hmm. The more that humans touch it and kind of do some, you know, adding some taste, adding some MSG, dextrose, whatever it is to make deli meat more tasty. Um, will be an impediment to your gut healing. So the more natural you can go, I think it's better. In terms of nutrient profiles, whether it's grass finished or um, just, you know, conventional grain fed, there's not a big difference. Um, People have done a ton of research on it. There's just not a ton of difference in nutrient profiles. I know people argue, well, there's hormones in these animal foods. I just haven't seen there to be a big difference. Um, I have had many clients that eat the whole nose to tail grass fed, grass finished. And, you know, they still needed to get on supplements to heal properly. Um, There are some that just eat grocery store and they're doing better. So it really, I don't know how much that nuance um, makes a difference now for climate and um, animal cruelty. It's a big deal. Absolutely. But in terms of um, just for your own health, I say just eat as natural of meats as you can and try to like not eat the deli meats. Um, if you could get milk that's raw, that's much better. If you eat um, pasteurized, even if it's grass fed, so like the Kerrygold butters, they're still pasteurized, meaning that they heat it. And a lot of the enzymes that are beneficial in meat are removed, or I'm sorry, in dairy is removed. And so then they add back, they fortify the vitamins back into these dairy products. So for some people that have gut issues or are sensitive, it doesn't do well for their body. The body's like, what is this, you know, um, processed food? Whereas if you eat real dairy and raw versions, it has the digestive enzymes. It has some of the antibodies that are, you know, active and live and are good for the gut. Um, as an example, like no one would ever give baby breast milk that's pasteurized, right? So why would we do that to our milk? Um, so ideally, and it's really hard to get, but it's possible if you could get raw milk, raw dairy, raw butter, that is a, 
and obviously trust your source, but that's really, really ideal. And then um, just stick to the more natural meats and you can find a lot of healing from that. I think that's great. I know we've basically only scratched the surface on all of this stuff because there's so much Absolutely. nuance and there's so much depth that I would love to, if you're into it, do it a future episode sometime in the new year. Yeah, it would be amazing. Where can uh, people uh, find your book, find your channel? She has an amazing channel. She does a lot of interviews that are really in-depth. She just did a great gut health series. Um, go check that out. We'll have all that linked, but please plug yourself. Sure. So, um, and again, thank you for having me, but so people can find me on nutri- um, at Nutrition with Judy. So Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. I have my ch- channel where I interview people that are, you know, some of them it's just sharing their story that's in the community. Some people are specialists in a certain area. I just interviewed someone that, you know, talks about how to heal from migraines. If you are suffering from migraines, it might be some of the carbohydrates. So um, it talks about that and um, hormone healing. And then you can basically get the book Carnivore Cure. So C-U-R-E dot com. Um, that's my website. But then you can get it on Amazon. The ebooks are everywhere. The paperback is only on Amazon.com and our website. And the ebook is everywhere. So like Barnes and Noble, Apple iBooks, all of that stuff. Um, and if you want to work with me, it's nutritionwithjudy.com.